Well, it is. So hi and welcome to the first EU community call. Um, so this is a very much an experiment, uh, but I hope to have um, to gain. What I hope to gain with this call is to to get a, a closer knit community in the sense that uh, um, you're all available, you're all able to bring up any issues or questions uh, that you have uh, regarding the project, and also. I've invited two people, Larry, uh, Larry Clapp and um, Egon Elbra. Is that correct, Egon? You can't hear. Close enough. <laughs> Close enough. Okay. To to show off what they're working on with the uh, GU, and I myself has a have a demo as well, if there's time for it. So I think I'd like to start with uh, just a bit of um, of status of the project. So what if what if uh, the recent work on on gu as well as uh, what i'm working on right now and a few points of uh, what i'm going to work on in the future at least what i intend to work on so for everyone who have who doesn't know about you it's um it's a immediate it's a library in go that allows you to uh, create immediate mode user interfaces and uh, it works across many many platforms all the major desktop platforms as well as uh, on the mobile so as as far as status goes i think the most interesting work being done lately at least in uh, that i know of is um, is the is the addition of a gpu abstraction and the addition and that sort of led into the uh, the work that uh, allowed direct the direct 3d backend to um, to be implemented into you so the gpu uh, abstraction is what allows you to take gu and use it in in a project that where you may not necessarily want to use the the GU's built-in uh, support for Windows and uh, not Windows the operating system, but the Windows system integration and input um, integration. So, say you have a game where you uh, you wrote the 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 code for for doing graphics yourself or using some engine of of a kind, and you have input some from somewhere else from either your engine or or uh, you have it. Uh, you, you take it in from the operating system yourself. Then you can take that input and sort of connect it to to you, so that you can use the same way of writing user interfaces just with all the GU built-in packages. You can use the same way to do that um, with your own project. And the and the example that shows how you can do that is the GLFV example in the in the GU repository. And it shows how you can use the GLFV packages and the I think it's called Go GL packages for for sort of using a foreign package for uh, the GLFV takes care of of your window and input and the Go GL packages takes care of you being able to access OpenGL the underlying OpenGL drivers from your system and the GLFV GU example simply connects all those pieces together to show a very simple uh, user interface. And the second thing is um, is Direct 3D, which is in itself may not be that interesting if you're not using Windows, but at least it makes sure that you can run as a standalone executable on Windows if you have Windows users or use Windows yourself, um, just like the other platforms. So presently, I'm working on, you may know that I've been hired to do the TailScale Android uh, application for um, for well, for TailScale, and TailScale is this um, implementation—a very, very simple implementation. It's not simple, but it makes uh, VPN deployments between your devices very, very simple. And the Android application is the Android story for that, where you can take your uh, Android phone or tablet or devices. In, in at least, if you can install the TailScale uh, app, you can take that device and bring it into your TailScale network. So I think that's interesting because it um, because TailScale allowed me to use the TU uh, library for the user interface, so that hopefully when the, the when the app is successful and widespread, it will serve as um sort of 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 uh, a very strong data point at least of um, the practicality of TU how how uh, that it's actually useful in practice for uh, serious uh, production applications. So that's the present. For the future, I hope to be working on some of the, I think some of you have mentioned uh, at least a few times these uh, these issues in the GU library. The first one is um, that I'd like to add support for making pop-ups. 
in the sense of right-click uh, context menus and also just in general being able to show dialogues and modal um, modal dialogues where you can ensure that the dialogues are on top and that you can't interfere with other um, uh, other parts of your user interface while this dialogue or pop-up is visible. And of course, deal with, I think the, the, the hardest problem is dealing with your pop-up um, approaching the edges of the window so that, is, so that it doesn't go outside the window bounds. And also if it's a very large pop-up, pop -up, making sure that it, that it knows that it has to be um, smaller and, and scrollable instead of taking up all the space that it wants. So pop-ups is the first one. And the second one is also very um, it's, it's a popular feature, is that uh, I'd like to give the editor a little bit of love. I think that the Larry, that's the, the expression from, from Larry Clapp, in the sense that I think it's time that, that the editor supports text selection and copy-paste. And of course, all the various um, keyboard, keyboard shortcuts that you, are expected, uh, that you expect to have on your native uh, editor widgets. Uh, so that, and there's also a little bit uh, some um, um, regarding the editor. I'd like it to be more better integrated uh, with with the mobile keyboard. So some someone may have noticed that you can't really enter all the special special characters in the editor on mobiles, and that's because uh, GU only uh, appears as a very simple input method. Uh, handler to the operating system to the mobile operating systems. So the so iPhone and iOS and, and Android will only give it very simple input commands. So I think that's about it for for what I intend to work on. So I'd like to move on to um, to the first demonstration. So I um, so Larry, would you like to take over from here? Sure. If you can um, hear me. So L Larry was. Larry was uh, both one of the very, very first and earliest uh, GU users and contributors. And he's also the one who created the GU Slack channel and, and convinced me to join, which I haven't, um, I haven't regretted that since, so. Uh, let me see, start presenting. So, hi everyone. My name is Larry Clapp. Um, I don't think I turned my camera on, did I? I should fix that. Here we go. Hi everyone. Um, my name is Larry Clapp. Uh, I saw uh, Gu at the I saw Elias at the GopherCon last year, and it was pretty neat. And so it uh, lit a fire under me to restart an app I had been working on off, off and on since like 2012. Um, in a nutshell, it's sort of a uh, combination between uh, SSH, Bash, Screen, and perhaps some other things. Um, it started off as a web app. Now it's a native Go Gu app. Um, and basically, the idea is that you have um, you have a, a local client that talks to a remote server running somewhere else, and you give it commands, and it runs the commands and sends you the output back again. And you're seeing some of my frantic development from this morning after I broke it last night, which is sort of a silly thing to do um, on the eve of a demo. Uh, but here we are, and it does seem to work again. Um, so I got this little thing down there. So I'm going to have to resize the screen. Um, the idea, as I said, is that you can run commands, and there it is. And I've got this little menu out here. Uh, not exactly a menu, but a, basically some buttons that you can show or not. And you can take any given command that you've run and, for example, zoom it into its own tab. you got a tab bar up here. Um, you can take a command and say, pop it out into a new window. Um, that's actually a separate executable, which is uh, maybe that's the way regular Macs or regular Mac apps, I should say, do. It, um, but it's kind of weird in that you get multiple uh, multiple windows when you press uh, when you press Command Tab, and it's the same under under Windows and Linux, I think. Um, but uh, so you've got a whole tab history or a command history. Um, 
one of the things that one of the the things that made me want to do this uh, way back in 2012 was I looked at my shell history and I said, you know, like 90% of what I do is CD and LS and frequently CD and then LS and then CD and then LS and CD and LS. And I thought that's really silly. So I wanted my browser or I wanted my my app, my shell to remember the tab, the commands or the directory that I've been in. And I wanted it to provide a clickable interface um, for that. And so that's what I wrote. And I also thought I work remotely a lot as I'm sure a lot of you do. Um, and I work in a low bandwidth situation a lot, which probably not as many of you do. And so I wanted my 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 client, my shell client, to use as little bandwidth as possible. So, for example, if I wanted to sort the directory that I just gave by time, that seems like something that should happen client side without running it again and having the having to make the server run it again. So basically, um, you've got buttons that you can do what for me are the most common the most common sorting operations sorting by name, time, and size. Um, and I haven't gotten around to like decoding user ID and the username, but I'm sure I'll, I'll get to that, to that eventually. Um, the directories are underlined, so you can you can click on them. And this is just my uh, my my Huck shell um, user uh, development tree, all the Go files in it. Um, Let's see. It all of these uh, you can you can filter. Um, it'll do regular expressions. So like find me something that ends in p, for example. So that's kind of neat. You can also it can do uh, a very easy um, command navig or uh, directory navigation. So if you if you press command n, enter what I call navigation mode, then it creates a new column. And then you have these various one character hotkeys to go to these directories. Um, so like I can press P to go to proto and then I to go to UI and go back up again. And so that's a little more obvious when you have like more so directories. Um, uh, but, uh, and then it has some history and all of these are just um, pretty standard view buttons, I think. Um, so it remembers the history, remembers uh, if you finally say, okay, that's your directory I want to be in. Um, let's say go up to home, um, then you can say CD, and it takes takes your uh, current shell back to your CD, back to that CD. Um, and of course, there's shell history. This is another. This is basically a neat, a neat, uh, a neat view thing where I press. The hotkey, which was shift, sorry, command slash, um, and it just stops drawing the other things and draws the stuff on top of it, which I think is a, it's one of the, the neat things about GU is that you know the, the graphic, uh, um, assets, I guess, um, when you're not drawing one tab, they're just gone, so it doesn't take up any resources when you've got different tabs showing. I could have you know, hundreds of commands in here in this tab. And in fact, I do. Well, maybe not this particular tab, um, but I could have hundreds of commands, and if they're not showing, then they take up no resources as far as the GUI goes. Obviously, the the client still sort still stores it all. Anyway, um, so in the client, this is your shell history, and you can do various things: copy the command into the clipboard, paste it into your um, current shell uh, editor. You can CD to the directory it was run in and paste it, or you can just CD and run it immediately. Um, and I just pressed escape to make that go away. And this, uh, this filters by regular expression. So I can say, show me everything that mentions the name of the shell. And it just updates um, in real time, which is neat. And I can say, like, show me everything where, I, where I've rsynced it to my other laptop. Um, and then if I want to do that, then I just press command return and it CDs to that directory and runs that command immediately. Um, so that's copying it to my laptop, uh, my other laptop. And the big drawback uh, right now is that it's not great with sudo. It's not great with like if you have um, uh, one command that starts another that starts another and you want to uh, abort all of them. Um, in Unix, that's called a uh, command group, I think, or a terminal group, a terminal leader. 
and I don't support that yet. If you want to kill something, it'll kill the top level, and the other two will be orphans, which is suboptimal. Um, but that's coming, and it also uh, doesn't do terminal colors at all. If you try to run Vim, you'll get a bunch of escape sequences. Um, so that's a fairly big job, and not one I'm, not one that I've tackled yet, but it is something that I've thought about it a lot. Um, so, are there any questions about the app with respect to the app itself, or with respect to any of the GUI tricks that I've that I've that I've done? Um, one of the neat things about this tab bar is that it's slideable. You can have lots of tabs, and the tabs are navigable by, in this case, command one, two, three, four, five, and the usual um, uh, convention, I guess that. You can go up to eight and then nine takes you to the last tab. One neat thing about the app itself is that all of this is stored in a database. If the server crashes or well, hopefully it won't crash, um, but if you restart the server, if you reboot whatever it's running on, you can restart it and say, show me all the commands I've ever ran. And it'll query the server and get them back and load them back into the GUI. So for example, this will, this will work. It shows my entire history back to when I started using this full time, mostly full time, back in January. Um, and you can filter on stuff like that to say, show me the commands. Um, I think I, I think it's here. Just show me the commands I've run in this directory, which is kind of neat. Most of the stuff that I do is based on the task, is based on where I am. So if you want to say, oh, you know, restore my context from everything I've done here, or or just in this tree. Um, I see stuff in the chat. Um, there's been a bunch of the stuff in the chat that I've missed. Uh, so then, question from Daniel. Yeah. Sorry, question from Daniel. Could you go into what things work well with you or which do not compare to your previous UI? Okay. Um, most of it works well with you. Um, it's, uh, let's see what doesn't work well. Um, so the editor, uh, well, uh, Elias has kind of mentioned that, um, the previous editor I used in my, in my web app was, uh, uh, code mirror, which was fully like, uh, BI compliant Vim, in fact, uh, fully full, full Vim, um, uh, integration, not integration, um, emulation. So you can do a lot more in, in the web editor. Um, uh, I think I think that sort of thing. Oh, and just just the number of number of widgets that uh, that a browser has, which you can do. I mean, you can make use of those if you're doing Gopher uh, Gopher JS or or JavaScript. Um, you has a bit of catching up on that uh, to do. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, aside from that, I, I found the GUI, the, the, the impedance mismatch um, of, of Go, much, much, much lower with GUI. Um, it's, all, it's all Go, it's all native Go. I don't have to fiddle around with translating to JavaScript. I don't have to fiddle around with talking to the browser. Um, I've been working on this um, in my spare time since last August, I guess, last GopherCon. And I think I've made uh, a lot of progress, a bunch of progress in that in that year that I that I hadn't made in nearly that amount of time um, on the browser app. One of the neat things you can do also in GU is you can say, go ahead and um, uh, work, a, work a separate executable. So like I can select a file, and since GU doesn't do really file selection yet, I just punt it and create a checkbox and say, edit the file. And it can fork a, a, an instance of GVM um, and, and give it a full file name and just pop it right up. And that's harder to do in a browser, if not impossible. Um, where was I? Uh, Daniel, did that answer some of your questions? Did you have any other follow-up? Uh, what about in terms of performance? Um, I guess it depends on what kind of things you are doing, but how, any experience on how it compares in general to web, web apps? Um, well, I mean, a lot of web apps are actually pretty fast. 
Um, I think Vue Vue is at least as fast as as the web apps that I've tried. It was certainly it's certainly faster faster than the one that I wrote, um, which was at some point it was uh, Go translated to translated to JavaScript by Gopher.js, um, and then that was on the browser, and then talking to a Go server over a WebSocket. Um, this is actually this this is a native Go app. It's talking to the server over gRPC. And that's another thing, gRPC, either it wasn't available or I didn't know about it um, earlier in my previous attempts. And gRPC is way better than trying to roll your own uh, remote procedure call uh, server client interaction. Um, but yeah, it's it's extremely speedy. Um, you know, you can, you can uh, just lean on the change tabs button and you can't even see them redraw, it's so fast. I don't know if that came through um, on the network, but it goes really fast. So yeah, I've, I've actually doing what I do, which is not, frankly, not all, not all that performance intensive. Um, in my app, it's 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 uh, it's quite speedy. I've been pretty really pleased. Um, Well, I said, I suppose you'd like App New Window to work for multiple windows. Yes, I would. Um, that would be nice. Um, it's not critical, but it would be nice. I'm not sure if maybe if I package this as a real as a real Mac app, if uh, if I would get um, if these would go away as a result of that. It might be. Uh, When I set my logger to trace mode. It's doing a few things. It's at least 30 frames. Yeah, I don't know what mine is. Um, I have, let's see, that's not it. I have something up here that'll show me frames per second, um, which I don't think that's, um, I don't know if that's frames per second of my actual app. Uh, it's the frames of my, of my, of my Mac UI. Um, I guess a final thing, um, all of this, this is a Windows VM. All of this is networked and running and runs under Windows and Linux. So this is the client running in the Windows VM talking to the Windows server. This is the same client running in the Windows VM talking to the um, Linux, sorry, the Mac server. That's my local Mac, um, what's name? And Ditto Linux. Um, this is the Linux VM and the UI running. Uh, apparently, that's crashed somewhere. Probably some network issue. Um, uh, but so it's it's cross platform. It's not as I use it almost entirely on 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 a Mac going to Linux boxes. So going other places is not as well tested. Um, I may have gone over my time. <laughs> Sorry about that. No, that's fine. Uh, it's, it's it's a very very impressive uh, program you have there. So, thanks. Um, I'm pretty pleased with it. I'm, um, I guess fair warning. I I this is not open source. I do want to try to sell it. Um, so feel free to hit me up on Slack if you want to know more. Great. Any more questions before we move on to the next demonstration? No. Okay. So, okay, Egan, so Egan okay. perhaps you would like to take over? Yes, of course. So I guess I have multiple demos that aren't as extensive, but they are maybe interesting, I guess. Um, so. I think the first things I started with was experimenting with uh, live graphics drawing because um, I often like to build myself some interactive debuggers and or kind of visualizations of what the program state is. So I guess the first thing I did was, um, which one? I think it was, was it this one? Okay. So just, uh, flower drawing itself. Um, I'm not sure how smoothly it comes across, but uh, like 
just to learn what the paths, how to draw arbitrary paths, I guess. And uh, the implementation is pretty much a sine curve that modulates in time. Um, so nothing too crazy, I guess. Um, then the next thing was this thing, um, uh, which is uh, kind of, um, so it draws out this circle or two circles and kind of goes around it and then just it starts modulating the time and the uh, width of the line. Here, because currently there's no proper line APIs and that stuff, and, and I wasn't feeling up to writing it at the moment, so I ended up using a lot of circles for this. So, uh, just, uh, so if I reduce the number of points, uh, so then you can see what's actually, so it's actually doing something like this actually. Uh, but when you have enough of them, then you, it's lo it looks close enough to a line, but it, it isn't really performant for, for um, uh, okay. Um, and then the final was a port of uh, an older example of uh, drawing flowers. This is based on, uh, so the original was a demo scene graphic something, and then I made my own version and then ported that my own version to Kia. And uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's, a good, nice demonstration about like just visualizing and interactive graphics, I guess. Um, any questions about the graphics before I go on for the uh, more practical applications, I guess? No? So I guess I'd like to ask you, what's the most pressing feature that you um, that you lack into you right now? I'm not sure whether, I don't think I've hit that limit yet because I think things like path drawing and, or line drawing and kind of, these are useful things to get things up and running, but uh, um, I can model myself through that. Um, I guess eventually some sort of a mesh API or something that would allow more custom is custom like drawing to to nine patch and uh, any custom shapes and stretching and stuff. Mm -hmm. um, have um, you done uh, work with other UI toolkits? And so how does this how does you compare? Uh, you say because this view is all all that I've done for the most part barring web apps. So I did write my own multiple, uh, but kind of due to lack of time, it, it's uh, they haven't gotten too far. Um, but I think it's generally nice. Yeah, um, I don't have any anything serious complaints. There are a few features that I liked from my previous. UI toolkits, uh, uh, it's, uh, I guess, uh, I'll count to the, I need to find the relevant code. So I guess, wait, not sure whether this had this button. So, So one of the things I had was uh, uh, kind of, this is my own UI code, but one of the things that I had was this uh, separate layers of uh, having multiple contexts stacked on top of each other. So I could say that, oh, draw this rectangle and then later say that, oh, draw a hover box over it or hovering information like text on it. And then maybe at some point I could 
draw something behind that separately. So it kind of makes some code just uh, easier to write. Um, I guess I think it should be possible to do in Kia as well. So um, I just haven't gotten that far yet. Um, so have you um, have you tried to use the the macro uh, the macro support in TU to uh, to have a drawing and then draw something behind it and save it for later? No, no, I haven't yet. Uh, I I know I noticed that they are there, but just yeah, okay. haven't gotten around it. Um, I guess. Uh, can show the more practical thing. So one of the things uh, I've been slowly building as I need things was uh, implementing uh, allocation viewer for programs. So I could live see live what the program is doing with regards to where it's allocating memory. And so in this case, um, It's uh, this demonstration program where this uh, line 15 here, here, this thing is leaking memory. So the uh, red thing shows that it's um, it's allocating something, and the green is showing when it frees something. So it, you can get the visual understanding for things that slowly leak when you're looking at the static. Uh, memory profile is usually not visible, like did it allocate something or not, or is it leaking or not? Um, and so, and if it's, uh, and uh, the other program is uh, kind of, yeah. So here it's uh, allocating and then freeing and constantly like being in a stable position, so. Um, what are you using as a, the data source for generating these graphs? Uh, I'm using um, mem profile uh, information. So I have this um, this thing that you need to import, and then it sends the mem profile data over. Um, however, one of the things that I found out is that it's not giving enough detail for me. So I probably need to change the runtime to give the actual. Uh, so there's the uh, code does have this uh, trace allocation, uh, like this information, but it doesn't uh, write it fast enough. So um, trying to use it on any large programs and parse this information is kind of annoying. Um, but um, yeah, I mean, I guess it's uh, it works and demonstrate has the can be useful. So, so do anyone have any questions for for one of the uh, two programs, three programs you showed? I think, uh, was it Chris Walton who asked about uh, interactive? Um, there's a question when you say interactive, what do you mean? Perhaps that I mean, was. I guess live is more appropriate. So a live visualization that's showing information real time as your program changes and allocates and sends information from one place to another. Right. Do you have anything else to show? Um, at the moment, no. Then I'd like to uh, finish uh, your demonstration by just saying th thank you very much for the beautiful uh, TU logo. So uh, you yeah, you're welcome. just kind of dropped uh, dropped it on Twitter that you'd like to do the logo, and I think it was perhaps an hour later than you had finished something uh, finished the current version. Uh, and it only needed a few more tweaks then. So I think it's very, very, very great and captures well what, what TU stands for. So thank you very much for that.
So I think uh, if everyone are still up to it, I, I, I'd like to demonstrate um, just very shortly what I've been working on for the past few months. Um, you may have seen, might, might have seen my uh, announcement on Twitter, but I've been working on a Go Unikernel, which is not directly in itself uh, GU related. Uh, so a, a Unikernel, for those who don't haven't heard about that before, I, ha I hadn't heard about it just a year ago, is that instead of having a fully fledged and 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 uh, resource hungry operating system driving your program a unikernel is just enough of, of an operating system or kernel to drive your program or the the, the set of related programs that you, you'd like to run and the intention is that you take this unikernel plus your programs or program and put them inside a virtual machine to have the virtual machine isolation but you can still but, but you also avoid the, the the inefficiency, but also all the security problems that are implicit in in, in large operating system kernels such as, as Linux. So the project I have working on is called Unique, which is I found out later is a, it has a name clash with another Go project, but still it's it's just a it's it's more or less a um, a proof of concept, so to speak, because I wanted to I wanted the Go runtime, the Go itself, to have support for for creating a program, a Go program, building a Go program that can boot directly in a virtual machine. So um, just to make this more interesting, I thought that perhaps this Unicurl should be able, just to demonstrate what it can do, and also demonstrate that it is possible to myself, is I'd, I'd like to, to run GU programs, of course. So that required me to uh, create, um, to write a driver for a virtual uh, GPU, and also a driver for the virtual mouse. I don't have keyboard support yet. and it. And because of that, it only runs on QEMO, which I have running on my Linux machine, and this is my Mac. So what you're going to see is, if I can start to presenting, yes. So what you're going to see now is a VNC session on over to my Linux machine, where I have the project running. I'll just use the other keyboard for it. So this is the unique project, and there's there are two sort of there's the build script which it uses the go command to build your program so this is you, you you give the build script a package or a set of go files that you'd like to build as a unikernel and this command makes sure that the that the entry point for the program is not the irregular uh, go entry point but instead the kernel uh, entry point the unikernel entry point and after that it's adds a simple custom bootloader and you and takes both the bootloader and the program and builds a fat image a very uh, a boot um, a bootable fat image that you can run in a, in a, on a virtual machine so if you run the build scripts with the supplied demonstration program it builds this boot image that you can boot with uh, qemo so QEMU, the QEMU command simply sets up a virtual machine um, with no network, and it sets up a, a UEFI boot, um, BIOS, as well as a as the bootable image that we created uh, with the previous command as a read-only CD, CD-ROM drive, so it can boot from that, and it sets up the virtual um, GPU this device and make sure that it supports OpenGL so that it is hardware accelerated. And finally, it sets up a, a virtual tablet, which is the most convenient to use um, um, to present a virtual mouse inside a virtual machine. And finally, it outputs all everything everything from the, ser the virtual machine serial port out to, uh, to the standard out output from, um, from the QE command. So if we try to run that, see this is the QE, uh, QE window. I'll just resize this to... So this is actually QEMO that uh, drives this window up here, the, the QEMO on toolbox window. But inside of that, it shows whatever the virtual GPU is drawing. So this is the this is um, so this is actually GPU driving the virtual GPU and drawing the kitchen example that you might have might have seen. And it also drives the virtual mouse so that you can actually interact with uh, with the program. 
If there are scrolling clicks, move mouse moves. I don't have the the keyboard uh, implemented yet. So actually, so this is actually it. It it simply demonstrates that the same program that you are used to running on all your regular um, operating system, it they, that can also potentially run as as a standalone um, bootable image on a virtual machine. So let's see if I can get back to. So that's about it. Do you have any questions for that? The source code, of course, is uh, is open source. It's on my um, uh, Git account. You can go to this URL, and you should be presented with the source code. And it contains everything in the kernel for driving the low-level CPU and the setting up timers and interrupts and so on. And of course, the two drivers for the virtual devices. So what, again, is your end game for, for this particular app? Um, no particular end game directly for this one. Um, my more grand idea was to, I wanted to, to uh, further down the road to create a something where you take, so, so it's very easy to run virtual machines in the cloud. And I'd like to make it just as easy to run um, on your own computer in your desktop machine. So the intention is, more or less, I haven't done anything uh, serious work in that direction yet. But the intention is to run everything in its own in its own virtual machine. So you may have, say, your Windows games running on one vir uh, virtual machine on the Windows, but you may also have uh, things like this um, a um, uh, a standalone program that could run on top of this system where virtual machines are just as easy to run as uh, as um, as you would on a program. So the intention is that you can have, instead of several programs that you can run uh, alongside each other, I'd like to have, um, say, several virtual machines or several programs that you run inside virtual machines. And, and they're just as easy to run as a double clicking on, a, on an executable in your, um, in your regular operating system. So this is kind of a, an exploration, exploration phase for that idea. Okay, cool. Any other questions? No? So let's move on to the, um, the last phase, which is, which is uh, open for everyone. So if you have any questions, regarding what you have seen. If you have anything completely unrelated to that, uh, you can bring them up uh, now if you want. I have a couple of questions for you, Elias, around um, widgets. So you said right at the beginning, um, you mentioned some of the um, improvements you're intending to make to editor, um, selection, cut, copy, paste, uh, more keyboard navigation and so on. That's great. What I'm curious about how far you intend to take that editor component. So, for example, I'm potentially interested in um, a bit richer support for um, font family variation. So, mixing um, style attributes for ranges of text in the editor. So, bold, italic, color, underline, and and so on. Not 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 a wide mixture of, of font sizes and nothing crazy, but say enough to imagine a, um, a syntax highlighting text editor, that sort of thing. Do you see that sort of um, richness making it into the core, or do you see that you'd only take it a little bit further than you have now and anything more would be up to individuals to contribute or I would say a little bit of both. I don't plan to work on uh, on rich text uh, in in the in the very near future, because I think there are other features that are just as important. But oh. I definitely intend for rich text uh, or text styling in general to to appear into you, the geo core. And you also need that for just for labels. So it's not really. Yeah. I wouldn't even say it's it's really an editor feature. It's simply rich text support for labels and and text drawing in general. Okay. And of course, and of course, the editor should support that. So, so that. Uh, but it. But of course, as as you also hint at, it it will probably never 
get as advanced as the you know the rich HTML editors or Markdown editors or something like that. But I hope to have enough for for uh, let's say cover by far the most use cases that you want the underlining syntax highlight lighting as you uh, as you mentioned yeah okay, that's great and then a more general question about widgets um I th i'm sure i've seen something in the mailing list or somewhere um that you intend to support things like um focus focus traversal and mm -hmm. so on mm -hmm. is that in the sort of the relatively near future or is that still a little way out um, I hadn't thought about it for for a while because I haven't worked on uh, on the desktop sites uh, for a while. But sure, it, it's it's actually it's actually one of the things that should be fixed because you, you don't have a, a nice desktop app if you don't if you can't manage the focus and the focus groups. Exactly, you've got yeah. some of the core widgets already, like a, a simple editor. Yeah. You you can implement things like radio buttons and checkboxes and so on. But to join that all up. The, the one of the missing point parts for me is um, is focus. But yeah, thank you. There is a very basic focus support already, so so it needs to be because the the system needs to tell which edit if you have several editors on the same screen, yeah, the system needs to know which one will receive. So there is very basic focus support. Uh, but what you meant of probably was the, the ability to control the traversal of focus uh, between the it, exactly with the keyboard typically yeah. with things like tab and shift yeah. tab that sort of thing yeah, yeah. oh sorry just one last question on that before i <laughs> monopolize this um have you any intention to um improve the text rendering at all um for for example um sub pixel anti-aliasing or or not um, I hadn't really. I hoped I would be able to avoid subpixel anti-aliasing, but what? Uh, but perhaps you're hinting at the the text rendering getting the text getting a bit blurry on low DPI screens. Uh, yes, ju just yeah. just yeah. generally the text quality, the rendering isn't as great as I typically expect with something like a well implemented support of free type or something. Yes, I think that uh, perhaps uh, subpixel anti-aliasing will be needed, which in which case we, uh, I'd have to um, implement it. But I hope to gain a lot of the quality back by simply adding a little bit of um, text stemming, uh, stem width uh, widening, oh, stem uh, darkening, yeah, yeah, dilation, whatever it's called. Yeah. And uh, because uh, I don't have any stem dilation today, but there are two uh, two things for for. Uh, for, for the small fonts, uh, for small text, you need the stem dilation in general, but also because GU is uh, sRGB, it, it renders in, in, in sRGB, um, in the sRGB color space, you have a tendency for the font to be uh, even more thin relative to ren text renderers that, uh, that renders in, um, in the RGB color space. So the sRGB color space is the correct one, it's the correct blending, but the fonts have been so, so it created with the at the at a time and the expectation that the renderer will use uh, the wrong sort of the wrong uh, color space. So, so text dilation will help in general, but it will also help sort of gain some of the the thickness back from uh, from the sRGB color space. So, yes, definitely. I, I, okay, I'd like that's to. great. I mean, that's not a big deal. It's just it's just be nice to have that. Uh, I think it's a big deal because text is is really really important to have crisp it, on the, on the screen. So. It, it is, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. So let's see if we have. Da, 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 da. I just had a quick question, Elias, <clears throat> on the um, the roadmap, and how is is there somewhere that you're sort of sharing the roadmap at the moment? Not so much a timeline of when you're going to get things done, but more if you like a sequence in which uh, you're planning to look at things. Um, so people can sort of gather around those those points um, and perhaps contribute, because if people can actually see the roadmap, at least in as you have it in your mind, of what's coming up in the future, uh, you potentially can gather more or gain more people contributing back to the project in some way, shape or form, or at least help shape the roadmap to, to be in a slightly different order or something like mm -hmm. that. Mm -hmm. uh, not yet. Um, I have an internal Trello board that I use for my own uh, prioritization, but it's a it's a real mess because it's it's my it's my internal one. <laughs> but I have been thinking about uh, publishing it. Uh, th the risk is, of course, if if I if I uh, have a you say a prioritized list and I choose to 
to, to work on something else than what is uh, strictly the top uh, item on the list, then perhaps someone could uh, turn out to be very disappointed. Um, I think that was my point about it not be, you not actually attaching any time to it, um, a timeline to the, to, the, to the roadmap. It's rather just, okay, the, this is, these are the very high level things that yeah. plan to work on so people can actually see it and contribute feedback and um you know when another project i'm working on we're actually doing this in github issues so mm -hmm. whether there's that they're sort of labeled in a special way to indicate that they're roadmap issues so people can then easily filter to see what the roadmap is by just filtering to see the roadmap issues mm -hmm. and they are sequenced by sort of release but there's absolutely no condition attached to the fact that they will be in a particular release. It just gives people some sort of public visibility of what's coming mm -hmm. because you're sharing this publicly on the call now. Um, mm -hmm. It sort of makes sense in some way, I think, yeah. to share it, share it with people so that yeah. other people can sort of join in. Yes, I'll do that. I, uh, have you, have any of you any experience in doing this on Trello boards, uh, public Trello boards? No? Right. Any more questions? Do, 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 do. So there's someone saying that the text is is that Loki? Um, so the text is horrendous, like the rest of my OS. But the text quality actually depends quite a lot on your your monitor resolution. So if you have a high resolution. Not a high resolutions per se, but a high DPI um, monitor, then your text will probably be uh, yeah, 4K. So 4K monitors. I have a 4K monitor myself. And, and the reason I was asking is because um, yeah, I'm on a much lower. Yeah, um, I've not got a high DPI, so it's more obvious to me. Yeah, definitely. So 4K will probably not need any text dilation uh, at all. But as soon as you go down to uh, 1K uh, monitors around that, you you will definitely need some kind of of um, compensation. So anyone else? So I have a question around uh, WebAssembly support and WebGL support. I know that in all of the documentation it's listed as kind of a alpha or beta you know where this is an experimental capability and i'm curious why it has that label and what the blockers are for it not being experimental anymore okay so your question is where do you see this experimental label is it the gu label or is it a go project uh, label Sorry, I meant specifically support for Geo rendering WebAssembly or WebGL. Yeah. So the reason I'm I'm saying it's experimental is because, um, so my primary so it's 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 a bit it's quite slow actually in in WebAssembly, but that's because the Go programs in general are quite slow in WebAssembly, and you won't probably won't see it for many programs because they're sort of the back end. Uh, I, I could imagine that people use it for, for what you, uh, you uh, normally use uh, Go for, which is uh, non UI and back end programs. But as soon as you do something like GU, which needs very, very rapid access uh, to to the underlying WebGL uh, API, the, the inefficiencies start to show. And the inefficiency, is, I don't know which one is the most dom dominant, but the first one is that the um, the Go runtime needs to be able to schedule Go routines uh, on the available threads. Uh, and that's very inefficient to do in WebAssembly because you don't have a general go-to. That's that's my understanding of it. So that uh, WebAssembly is more or less implemented such that each function has a, a huge switch that tells how far in the, into this function did the Go routine that was scheduled from this function reach. And when you then need to reschedule that, um, Go routine, you sort of emulate the go to by going through all the functions and and uh, using the switch to 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 hit the correct point uh, of uh, of rescheduling. That's my understanding of it. So is that that's very inefficient. The second thing is that you only have one thread available in WebAssembly, and that's uh, that's just not going to use your utilize your CPU that well. 
And the third thing is that to call any underlying um, APIs. So WebGL is of course not a, a, a native, it's a native API, so it's implemented in C or C++ somewhere, but you have the only way to access it is through JavaScript. So when Geo calls an OpenGL function, a WebGL function, it calls the uh, syscall slash JS. Uh, it's sort of a reflect like wrapper for JavaScript. That's a Go package. So it calls that, which is inefficient in itself, which then ends up in JavaScript, which then ends up into, inside the browser, which then converts it to uh, to the underlying OpenGL call. So there's a lot of inefficiencies in the Webin's AppAssembly uh, implementation. Some of them are, um, you can say the scheduling problem, it could be, you could see, say that's a Go runtime problem, but I, you could also see it as as a as a as a limitation for for WebAssembly, but all these things sort of conspire to make uh, the WebAssembly uh, experience not so great. I ask uh, primarily because I've been developing uh, some stuff intended to run either in the browser or as a native application, and that has worked pretty well for me. Like I, I definitely see a some performance differences, but um, like I'm implementing a networked simple card game and it can run in your browser or not mm -hmm. um, really transparently. And that's that's been like a pretty compelling property. And mm -hmm. I definitely, uh, I saw in, in the comments that the go to web assembly is still marked experimental and, and that's also a good reason, but uh, it's, it's a cool space to be playing with. Mm -hmm. I'd, I'd love to have uh, the WebAssembly port run uh, with the with comparable performance because I I think that your use case is, is very very compelling. You can write something in Geo and you can have that more or less easily ported between the desktops and the browser and of course for the mobile. So I'm I'm very very annoyed that this is is this is not as performant as as I'd like. But I can't really see yes if I, if there was a short let's say a, a, a reasonable amount of implementation work ahead just to make it performant on the on the go side then i would probably do uh, do it myself but there are simply so many issues to to deal with also at the lowest web assembly level which i can't do anything about which is something that the browsers need to fight out uh, among themselves so yeah for, but it's not ex experimental in the sense that i think it's it, it's it's 99% the same code that runs in your browser so it's not experimental in the sense that um you can expect your programs to run almost exactly the same in the browser as you would see it on the desktop. So the experimental part is mostly uh, the performance, primarily the performance actually. Okay, thank you. So Paul, you're asking. Yeah, so the, the, as, um, this is absolutely not my expert expertise area. But as I understand it, the overhead that you describe, where effectively you've got the marshalling that exists from WebAssembly world to JavaScript world and then to sort of WebGL world, is, is tantamount to the same problem that exists with um, writing WebAssembly programs that manipulate the DOM in some way, shape, or form, because they always also have to go via the JavaScript um, memory space. Um, so it, it was just a question of it, that a lot of the overhead, if that's where the if that's the bulk of the overhead, notwithstanding the threading problems that you described there, because they could potentially be solved with web workers in some way, shape, or form, if um, if that were possible. Um, but if if that DOM overhead problem is is um, being solved, and I, it's been talked about for a couple of years at least, so I don't know whether that's um, making any progress or not. But if that DOM effort is also going to help with the WebGL side of things, that might be something we. So I just follow along too, I, but I'm definitely not up to date on, on it. So that was why I phrased it as a question. Okay, I, I believe it's the same problem. Okay, cool. And uh, because everyone is feeling this one, this uh, problem of going through JavaScript uh, before you can do anything else on the browser side. And I think there's an interesting, uh, it's called, I think it's called Vasi, uh, like this. Um, and I think the, the maintainer of the WebAssembly port has done a, fork of Go uh, implementing WASI. So WASI is a WebAssembly system interface. I think it's meant for using WebAssembly on uh, natively and not in the browser. But I, uh, and, the, uh, and the idea is to have a WebAssembly native way of describing 
APIs, so system APIs. So if you have the DOM or the WebGL or something else that you need to access from, from inside WebAssembly, you would be able to create bindings to that without uh, and cut, uh, cut the JavaScript middleman um, out uh, completely, which I suppose will, would solve the, the majority of this performance problem. But I'm still not sure whether, because we're still, we still have the scheduler problem in uh, the lack of go-to in, in the WebAssembly bytecode. And also in general, uh, which I think I didn't mention, uh, WebAssembly bytecode is, 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 um, is um, uh, runs on a virtual stack machine. Uh, I, I suppose it's similar to the Java virtual machine. And a stack machine is vastly different as far as I understand it from a register machine, um, which is uh, your regular CPU, the AMD CPUs and the ARM CPUs. So the Go compiler itself is optimized to, um, to output efficient code for uh, register machines, such as AMD for 64 and ARM, but the, it's not particularly well optimized to output efficient code for stack machines, uh, such, as, uh, such as WebAssembly. So there's, I, I think that you will see there still will be some performance problems even after going this, um, uh, using this WASI thing. But I guess the key point is that it's, it's a, um... Well, no, actually, I was gonna. That that maybe links to Daniel's question about um, Tiny Go. So maybe I'll be quiet and hand over to him. Oh, uh, so Daniel, uh, could you take uh, ask again? Um, so my question is, I guess it's two parts. The first one is, does uh, Gear work with Tiny Go? And the second is, if it does, or if it happens to, is that something we want to ensure works in the long term? Because it might be useful for some use cases like web or mobile. Um, I don't know. I haven't tried, but I'd really I, I wanted to try it since I learned about time to go. I, I simply haven't gotten gotten around to it. And I think the reason was that someone said that select statement didn't work in Tiny Go, or was it maps with interface keys? I think there was a, a certain feature that I think uh, that GU uses at the at its very core. So I thought that I'll, I'll just postpone it for a while. But I I definitely would like to have GU run on Tiny Go, just not just because um, it may run better in um, uh, in its uh, in WebAssembly with Tiny Go, but also because Tiny Go enables the very very small runtime, so that GU programs uh, take up take up much much less space. Is there an issue open for that? It might be a good way to, uh, even if nobody plans to work on it in the short term, it might be a good way for just to people, uh, for people to coordinate if they do want to do, do anything you, with it. You asked if there's an issue for it? Yeah. I if haven't it's seen worth. It. It, it is, it is, it is. I'll just um, see if I can I'll write it down. Yes, I'll I'll try and remember. So the roadmap thing, I'll I'll look into ex exporting, and I'll um, do an issue on Tiny Go because that would be that might very well be a worthwhile um, endeavor. So there, so Tiny Go roadmap. Yeah. So anything else I missed in the chat? Do, 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 do. So uh, yes, you, you, Loki, you mentioned that Go handles a single thread pretty well. In fact, Go coroutines with first device and single core systems. Yeah, I agree. Um, Go is, is designed to to schedule your many, many potentially many uh, coroutines on much, much fewer cores and also on on a single core. I just mentioned in in the sense that since the browser only exposes one core per WebAssembly program. Um, you're not really utilizing the your multi-core system as much as you would be if you ran it as a native uh, program. So you say it's the GPU drivers that will be the big issue if you use uh, Tiny Go. How would you? Could you expand on that, Loki? Mm -hmm. 
Oh yeah. Okay. So you mentioned um, you say that the GPU drivers will be a issue if you use Tinyco. Yep. That's because you're thinking of the Tinyco. The, the the usual case for using Tinyco is to compile programs to run on embedded systems. I think that what Daniel meant was Tinyco also supports compiling Go programs to WebAssembly through a different way it uses. I think it uses the LLVM um, backend for producing WebAssembly, which in, might in turn be much more efficient uh, than what the, the usual st uh, standard Go compiler can, uh, can, can produce. So I don't think there is a GPU driver problem there because we'll just, we'll just be, if that works, we'll just be using WebGL uh, through WebAssembly. And Chris, you mentioned you have a feed. You're working on a feature where we can get a pointer enter and leave events. Yes, that's right. And I also plan to fix uh, with enter and leave events. I hope to fix one of Larry's. Um, he brought up an issue a while back about how every time you move your cursor, your pointer uh, um, on top of a GU window, it will continually re-render. And I hope to, if we have pointer enter and leave events, we can somehow mark which is not being interested in just raw moves. And then you will know not to redraw your, um, your user interface just because you move your pointer. I think that's about it. Anyone else? No. So let's wrap it up then. What are the best introduction materials for me to mode GUI? Um, <laughs> uh, I th yeah, well, you can start with the, my article. <laughs> I wrote a, a short introduction about immediate mode. Uh, So it's it's a shameless self plug, but uh, I haven't actually seen that much other uh, introduction uh, introductionary uh, material. There's the um, I don't know if you if you know about it. There's the G Dear Image Imgui C plus plus library, which uh, which G U is in, very much inspired that. Uh, by that one. So that's in C++, of course, but you may be able to uh, to take some of the lessons and tutorials from there in the project and, and, and sort of translate them to the GU world. And the one that really sparked all this uh, several years ago is uh, KZ Oratorius Immediate Mode video. That's more, I can see if I can find it, it's from 2005. See if I can find it. It's there. So this one. Oh yes, there's also Nucula. I haven't uh, uh, used that project myself. Uh, da, 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 yes, it's written by Alessandro, I think. Mm -hmm. Alessandro is the one that also wrote, he did this Nucula, and I think he did it as a, as a he needed um, some toolkit for doing the graphical version of Delve, and Delve is the Go debugger, and the, so I think it's called pdelve. That's the one. So there it is. And in fact, I asked him way back whether he would consider porting GDELV to run on GU. And he said, well, if it supports X11, and then someone came ar uh, around and did the X11 backend, the Linux X11 backend for GU. And I 
sort of half jokingly prodded him and said, well, X11 is ready. And then he just a few days later uh, <laughs> did the port to uh, to Q. So that's very nice. And yes, it's true. I think he used, he mentioned that in Nucular, he uses um, Q as a backend, at least on some platforms. Uh, I think he mentioned Mac OS as, as one of them. So that it can, so I believe that Nucular can actually run with Q as a backend and it can also run uh, with Shiny as a, as a backend. And perhaps also DLFV, as Loki mentioned. But overall, there's not that much material available for the immediate mode design because there are just not many toolkits doing that. Uh, I only know about those uh, a small handful. So I, I think I'll voice this question out loud. Uh, I was thinking the other day about how I got started in Go using the playgrounds and the, the tour of Go. And I was wondering about the feasibility of building a Geo playground that used the WebAssembly renderer to show you your program. And I, I wasn't sure if there were any like weird browser security constraints related blockers to that working because that is not my normal domain. I don't know. I think play, I would love to see a playground. I've, I've wanted it uh, more or less uh, since I started with this project because I, I also, as you, I, I, I'm a great believer in being able to just try the things out immediately and not having to install anything. So the thing that has blocked me from doing uh, something like the a GU playground other than the time to do it, is that I'd, I'd have to um, uh, provision some server um, some server resource to, to do the compilation. But other than that, I don't think it's 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 much trouble at all. Uh, you could probably fork the the, the regular golang.org uh, playground, and then um, you could probably, yeah, and then just build it on the back end and then send down a, a WebAssembly module in an iframe or something like that. So yeah, some Paul says that the Go4JS playground does just that. So um, oh, yeah, just that's the up. next. Yeah, the next thing is, uh, thing is I, I've, I've been looking for options to do the compilation client side, because I think um, um, there's a guy. The Go4, yeah, the Go4JS playground works in exactly that way. So there is no back end to it at all. So, and I, as, as far as I recall, the, there is a WebAssembly version of the, the go for js playground in effect. So all of the compilation happens on cli client side as well. So the, the thing that you can consume in that situation is like a text star input. So if you want multiple files, um, you, you effectively provide just one massive string that can be split apart and according to the text star format. Um, but then all the, Parsing and interpreting happens at client side. So I, but I, and I, but it's only sort of from a rough recollection that someone wrote a WebAssembly version of that. I'll try and is, is that it. Hajime Hoshi? Uh, uh, yes, thank yeah. you. Yeah. I think he, he, he I saw it uh, a while back where he worked on the WebAssembly version of uh, of the compiler of the tool chain basically. Yep. And when I saw that, I, I thought, okay, now it's possible to do so. So it's actually just a question of, of uh, putting uh, all the pieces together. Someone mentioned though that the that the WebAssembly versions of the toolchain is was it, was it several hundred megabytes? Yeah, but you could just avoid using the toolchain entirely if you wanted to just use the um, uh, or could you? Yeah, you. Sh uh... Maybe you can't actually in that situation because Go4JS is able to specialize in that situation um, because it just works with the um, translating the Go types packages. Yeah, yeah. And I don't think you can do that with WebAssembly. I'll, I'll be quiet now. <laughs> but I, I think Hajime uh, got it to run in the sense that it actually works on the client side. And that's that's the thing I would prefer to do because I really hate to be managing uh, servers and, and uh, uh, denial of service, protecting them and, and uh, making sure that they are kept online and all that. So, uh, well, so the, qu the the answer to the question is, is very much possible. It's just a, a question of, uh, of putting all the pieces together. Yeah. <laughs> 
yeah, rate limit, spam, authentication, yada, yada, yada. <laughs> just get a company to sponsor it. <laughs> yeah, but that's just the yeah that's that's just just the the, the cost. There's still the managing and and uh, and all the the additional work around securing your machines and yeah. I, it's also to me just a cleaner approach to 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 put all the work uh, burden on the client client's machine. If it weren't for the WebAssembly size of the tool chain, that would be an obvious choice to do it, uh, an obvious way to do it. It just means it takes longer to load and they can cache that now. So, I mean, it's it's not prohibitive. It's just a little slow the first time you do it. Can they cache it uh, though when it's so large? My understanding is yes. Okay, so the browser actually allows you to keep uh, several hundred megabytes of, uh, of WebAssembly in the cache for more than five minutes. <laughs> I, I don't know how much or how long, but my understanding is that the Gopher JS uh, uh, playground will be cached locally. Yeah, yeah, sure. But that's uh, I think Paul, you mentioned that they do it in a slightly different way uh, because they have in Gopher JS they has have the compiler in JavaScript already. Is that uh, yeah? No, no. The, the the compiler itself is written in Go, um, but the only thing that the Gopher JS Trans, let me call it a transpiler. The only thing that the Go4JS transpiler works with is the um, the Go types package. Whereas, as I understand it, what's required for the WebAssembly support is that you actually need the entire Go tool chain in order to generate WebAssembly. Unless, um, but I might be totally wrong on that understanding. Well, maybe it wouldn't work. I don't know. Anyone else? Going once, going twice. <laughs> All right. So let's uh, so let's wrap this up for now. <laughs> You're far more to date. There's a. There's a GLS. Yeah, so Luke says if there is a GLS backend like using GG, I don't know what that is, then you might be able to run the kitchen team on the playground and run a, 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 a static image. So I think, uh, yes, so the fine guys uh, who's doing the fine UI toolkit, they have a software renderer, and I, uh, I believe, and that's what allows them to run um, their UI uh, stuff in the playground and then draw at least a static image of it. So that's possible if you have a software renderer. And it, it would be possible if you have, okay, so it's a vector drawing, GG is a vector. Yeah, 2D rendering in Duo with a simple API, yes. So if there was a, a software renderer in GU, which I think we should probably have at some point, then you would be able to run it in playground and then display a, a static image. And that would be great for simple demonstration. But what I'd like for in a GU playground is to have um, uh, where you can input a program and then actually interact with it. So it runs in your browser because, it, well, it, it supports WebAssembly, so why not? But yes, definitely. With a software backend, we could at least do static images um, from the regular play, uh, playground. So is that it? <laughs> I'm good to go. <laughs> so let's wrap this, this up for the, the third time. Um, and Paul, would you like to stop the recording and... and uh, yeah, I'll stop as everybody starts to drop off. Yeah. yeah, great. See you, everyone. Thanks, Elias. <laughs>